Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to thank the conference organizers for the invitation to give this tribute lecture on George Duffing. Unfortunately, I cannot be with you in person today, but I hope the presentation will be clear and interesting. George Duffing was a German engineer and scientist. He lived for 83 years, spanning the 19th and 20th centuries, and is famous for the book that he wrote 100 years ago in 1918. The book is entitled in English, Forced Oscillations with Variable Natural Frequency and Their Technical Significance. This is the equation named after Duffing. And most of you are familiar with this. Of course, it is the term in red, plus or minus K3Y cubed, that distinguishes it as the Duffing equation. And so to the outline of our talk. We'll first give some historical context to Duffing's work. Then we'll give a potted history of Duffing's life before talking a little about what he wrote in his book. We'll then give our personal perspective on his legacy before closing with a summary. First, an historical perspective. Let's start in 1678 with Robert Hooke, who wrote down the equation for a spring. Nine years later, in 1687, Isaac Newton wrote down his famous second law. 63 years then passed until Leonard Euler connected the stiffness force and the inertia force and described the phenomenon of resonance. I still find it amazing that this equation is described within a few minutes in a modern lecture, but when it was done for the first time, it took 72 years from the definition of Hooke's law. We now move on about 100 years or so until Hermann von Helmholtz introduced a nonlinear stiffness. He was studying the human ear and he thought that the eardrum behaved as an asymmetric oscillator, such that the restoring force was proportional to the square of the displacement, giving rise to additional harmonics in response to a tonal input. It turns out, of course, that this was not correct. He was correct, however, in introducing the quadratic nonlinearity k2y squared to describe an asymmetric stiffness. Around the same time as Helmholtz, Lord Rayleigh was working on a whole range of problems involving acoustics and vibration. He, however, wrote down the equation for the free vibration of an oscillator containing a symmetric nonlinear stiffness. He gave the equation in volume one of his book but did not give many details. It is believed that this is the first time the cubic stiffness term, K3Y cubed, was written down. Before turning specifically to George Duffing, it is worth mentioning some closely related work that was carried out prior to the publication of his book. The first is Ralph's book, in which a system similar to that described by Rayleigh was analysed. A few years later, Martinson and Biermans described the nonlinear relationship between the current and flux in an inductor in terms of a linear and a cubic term. As you are aware, George Duffing was German. He was born in Waldshut in Baden in 1861. He married Elizabeth Loft in Berlin in 1907, and the couple had four children. Duffing died in Schwedt in northern Germany in 1944 and is buried in Berlin. George Duffing was the oldest of six children. When he was one, his family moved to Mannheim, where his grandfather had a large wood yard on the river Neckar. Between 1878 and 1883, Duffing undertook his higher education, spending one year at a mathematical school one year at an engineering school and three years at the mechanical engineering school at the Polytechnic, which today is the University Friedrichiana in Karlsruhe. After graduating, Duffing moved to Cologne and worked for Deutsche Motorenwerken. It is not clear how long he spent at Cologne, but while he was there, he developed steam engines. <laughs> 
He was also involved in other engineering work, and here is one of Duffing's patents. It is for a speed regulator and was registered in the United States in 1905. In 1910, Duffing spent some time at Westinghouse in the United States. In the early part of the 20th century, Westinghouse hosted several famous engineers, including Timoshenko and Den Hartog, but that was some years later. It was clearly the place to be at that time, as it was a key player in rolling out electrification in the United States. Duffing returned to Germany in 1913, aged 52. He lived in Berlin, where he worked as a self-employed inventor and scientist. He chose Berlin because he wanted to listen to the lectures of Max Planck on quantum theory. During the First World War, Duffing was working on vibrations, brakes, gears and engines. And on Sundays, he would go to the lab at the Royal Technical Faculty with his eldest daughter. Professor Meyer allowed him access so that he could conduct some experiments. It was during this time that he completed his book, which was published by Vueg and Son in 1918 and cost five Deutschmarks. In 1921, the Duffing family were in financial difficulty and so they moved to Hamburg. Duffing was employed as head of an oils laboratory by the forerunner of the famous Shell Company. Whilst he was at the company, he invented an oil viscosimeter. A tragic part of his life came in 1927 when the ship Cap Arcona experienced engine failure during a voyage. His company had provided the oil that was made according to Duffing's instructions. There was an inquiry and Duffing testified that he had subsequently found that many types of oil had been mixed, probably to save money, and this resulted in the engine failure. Because he had testified against the company, Duffing lost his job. The Duffing family moved back to Berlin in 1931. Now aged 70, Duffing carried on with his research and inventing activities. At the time of the Second World War, he had particular difficulties during the bombing raids, as he could not easily take shelter because of problems with his leg due to a thrombosis that he suffered earlier in his life. The family subsequently moved to Schwedt, a small peaceful town on the river Oder. They stayed there until he died in 1944. Now some details about Duffing's book. First, we would like to thank Keith and Heather Worden for the partial translation of the book into English. Two general observations can be made. The first is that Duffing was motivated by his personal practical experience and observations of engineering systems. The second is that he realized that he did not have the necessary mathematical tools to solve all the problems. He was hoping to inspire some mathematicians to develop some additional methods. Here is a list of the contents of the book which is 134 pages long. As you can see, there are seven chapters covering a variety of topics. We do not intend to go into the details of each chapter, but hopefully you will get a flavor of the main concepts discussed in the book. It is in chapter two that Duffing begins to explore nonlinear oscillations. As you can see, the chapter is entitled pseudo-harmonic oscillation. It is split into two parts, one for free vibration and one for forced vibration. The general equation of interest describes an asymmetric system with softening qubit nonlinearity. It is a softening system that is predominantly studied in the book. To simplify the analysis, 
stuffing studied two particular cases. The asymmetric one with only a quadratic stiffness nonlinearity and the symmetric one with only a softening cubic nonlinearity. The harmonically forced system has the same general form as that on the previous slide. But here the symmetric system is chosen to illustrate the method of analysis. He solved the equation using a method of successive approximation, which subsequently became known as Duffing's method. He showed that the response consists of a first and a third harmonic. Further, he derived the frequency amplitude equation, which will be discussed in greater detail on the next slide. To determine possible solutions of the frequency amplitude equation, Duffing plotted the left and right hand sides separately as a function of the amplitude A. By doing this, it is possible to see the conditions when there are one or three solutions. In the plot shown, the graphs intersect at three points, giving three possible amplitude solutions, A1, A2 and A3. A fact which, of course, is now well known. Duffing also considered these equations in the same way, giving the response, frequency amplitude equation and graphical solution. Remarkably, no frequency response curves are given in this chapter or indeed anywhere in the book. Turning now to chapter 3, in which Duffing describes his experiments. The test rig is a very interesting design requiring no electrical power to operate. Essentially Duffing studied the free and forced vibration of a symmetric and asymmetric pendulum. The small pendulum in the center was the structure studied. The large pendulum on the left was used to generate a driving force through the spring K1 with the vertical spring V being used to control the natural frequency of the large pendulum and hence the excitation frequency. The large pendulum was kept in motion by small impulses applied manually. The spring K3 attached to the small pendulum was used to control the asymmetry of this structure. You can see a large scale drawing of the small pendulum. The natural frequency of this pendulum could be adjusted by changing the position of the upper mass marked G. Here is a schematic of the pendulum from the previous slide. It is shown in its asymmetric configuration, so the equation of motion is given by where x is the independent variable. The excitation induced by the large pendulum can be represented by a sine omega t. The linear, quadratic and cubic stiffness coefficients are related to the physical parameters as shown. Note that if psi zero is set to zero so that the pendulum is vertical when it is in its static equilibrium position, then beta is equal to zero and the system is symmetric. Duffing considered both symmetric and asymmetric cases experimentally. You will recognize the frequency amplitude equation shown previously. He reported results for the asymmetric case with an initial angle of about 37 degrees and compared the results with theory using the amplitude frequency equation. The effect of asymmetry is accounted for with the term shown in green. Among other topics covered in the book, chapter four investigated the effects of linear viscous damping and chapter five examined the stability of the solutions. In chapter six, Duffing describes the technical relevance of his work and specifically discusses Martinson's 1910 paper as an example. Let us now take a look at what happened after the publication of Duffing's book. It took some time for his work to become known and maybe this was because the book was written in German. Possibly the earliest papers that cited Duffing were by Hamel who also wrote two reviews of the book. We pick up the story with Hamel in 1922, who also studied the pendulum 
but did not use Duffing's approximate equation. In 1923, Rudenberg considered both nonlinear electrical and mechanical systems, continuing the work of Martinson and Duffing. Appleton studied the softening behaviour of a galvanometer in Cambridge in 1924. He observed multivalued responses and produced frequency response curves. Appleton did not cite Duffing's work, so it is not known if he was familiar with it. Four years later, in 1928, ten years after the publication of Duffing's book, his name appeared in the title of a paper written in German by Lachmann. In the same year, Duffing's work featured in Timoshenko's classic book on vibration problems in engineering. This is probably the first time Duffing's book was cited in a publication written in English. Moving on five years. Den Hartog cites Duffing's book in a paper on nonlinear vibrations in 1933. It is speculated that the connection with Westinghouse may have had something to do with it. Five years later, in 1938, Rauscher wrote a paper on the vibrations of systems with asymmetric nonlinear stiffness and cites Duffing's book as being the long established text on the subject. An event in the 1930s is believed to be key in the projection of Duffing's name to international fame. A group of German applied mathematicians, including Richard Courant and Kurt Friedrichs, fled Nazi Germany to work in New York University in the United States. They were later joined by the American James Stoker. During the 1940s, this group worked intensively on nonlinear problems. In a series of lectures given by Friedrichs and Stoker in 1942, they described the equation for an oscillator containing a linear and a cubic stiffness as Duffing's equation. Later in 1949, Levinson, who had carried out his doctoral work at New York University, wrote a paper in the Journal of Applied Physics in which the Duffing equation and Duffing's name appear in the title. This was followed up in 1950 by the seminal book by Stoker in which Duffing's name was firmly attached to the well-known equation. Fast forward to 2008. 90 years after the publication of Duffing's book, Ivan Randide decided to edit a book containing many aspects of the Duffing equation. Apart from ourselves, there were nine contributors, some of whom are in the audience today, and the book was published in 2011. Part of our research involved tracing the history of Duffing and his legacy. So what has happened since the 1940s? Here is a graph of the number of papers citing Duffing from 1951 to 1974. It is clear that there was not much interest until the late 1960s, around 50 years after the publication of Duffing's book. We will leave you to ponder why there was this trend. The graph on this slide shows the number of citing papers from 1975 to 2009. You can see that there was a gradual increase, levelling out at about 200 papers per year. This graph shows the number of citing papers for the past eight years. It seems that a steady state has been reached at around 200 papers per year. So who has an interest in the Duffing equation? This pie chart shows the citing papers grouped into subject areas from 1951 to 2009. It is clear that the lion's share is in engineering, followed by physics and then mathematics. If we look at the pie chart for the past eight years, we see that there are some similarities but engineering has fallen by about 9%, physics by 3%, with an increase in mathematics of about 
Before we close, we thought it would be interesting to show a list of Duffing's publications. As far as we know, there were nine. Bear in mind, however, that he was not an academic. This was his hobby. It is worthwhile, perhaps, to contrast his output with today's norms. We will say no more. Finally, to his equation. It seems to us that this equation is known as Duffing's equation because it has the cubic term. Note the plus and minus sign in front of the linear stiffness. Duffing, however, did not study this equation. But nowadays, as long as there is a cubic term, then it is known as his equation. The changing of the sign of the linear stiffness gives the equation a new lease of life as it can now describe a snap-through system. If there's a quadratic term as well, then it seems to be known as the Helmholtz Duffing equation. And so to the summary. In this brief talk, we've tried to summarize the life and work of George Duffing. He probably did not know it at the time, but an equation would be named after him. And this equation has become one of the key equations in nonlinear vibrations. We have tried to give a timeline of how his work became recognized after his death and also his legacy. Many thanks for listening. Even though this has been a recorded lecture, I hope it has come across okay. Enjoy the rest of the conference. You have noticed that Duffing's book was published exactly one century ago, so in 1980. And that was the main motivation actually for me to introduce tribute lectures at Enolides. And then it came logical also to have a tribute to Poincare and also to have a tribute to Ali Hassan uh, and uh, And I also hope you've seen what he was able to do exactly one century ago. As the editor in several journals, I nowadays see many times how we reinvent the wheel, yeah, trying to develop methods for the solutions that have already been derived and existed even one century ago. I also hope you've noticed that he wasn't an academic. He didn't work at the university. He was an engineer, but um, he used elliptic functions, which is for me uh, very important. He was an engineer, being able to understand and to use elliptic functions. And at the end, uh, I also would like to stress that although my co-author uh, several times, many times, mentioned his name in a usual and accepted way as Duffing. I would like to point out that it should be actually Duffing. And you will always hear me saying in that way. Mike and I have had arguments many times about it. But you know, English people, they tend to do things in their own way. And so I would like you, if you start pronouncing his name in a proper way as Dufing and referring to the Dufing equation.